Cavalcade of America. Starring Walter Hamden and Una O'Connor with Joan Loring and Stotts Cotsworth in One Last Romance. Presented by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Good evening. This is Bill Hamilton. One of DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry is neoprene. In industry, many workmen wear gloves made of DuPont neoprene rubber to protect their hands. Neoprene resists heat and cold, oils, acids, and abrasion. Now, some of these qualities are certainly not necessary in children's mittens, but one alert manufacturer is now using neoprene in making mittens for children. They are double-lined inside for warmth, and the neoprene coating helps seal out cold and moisture. Stands tough wear. Many dealers do not yet have them. But when you see these bright fire engine red mittens on display, buy a pair for your favorite child. We are sure you will like this new use of neoprene. Neoprene, one of the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry. Now, one last romance starring Walter Hamden as Benjamin Franklin and Una O'Connor as Abigail, with Joan Loring as Elizabeth, and Stotts Cotsworth as Stephen. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, as we all know, was a great American, skilled in education, science, literature, and statesmanship. Well, this story reveals his eternal youth, his gaiety, his inventive genius in the field of romance. <laughs> It is night in colonial Philadelphia, the finest house on one of the finest streets. Only a single light way up in the far corner of the third floor. He's coming, Miss Elizabeth. I ran up the back way to warn you because it's nine this minute. And last night you weren't ready another night before. Oh, Miss Elizabeth, do leave off writing. And sit in your rocker the way he likes you to. Yes, presently, Abigail, presently. Oh, you know he blames me when you aren't trim and waiting with the Bible open. Oh, that's such a mockery to read the Bible to him. Last night you didn't even know the chapter where you'd left off the night before. Well, I know tonight you can find it for me. Chapter 12. Oh, and you haven't anything blue on. He always wants you to wear something blue. Oh, well, my kerchief is on the bed. Hand me that. Please, Miss Elizabeth, will you stop your writing? I shudder lest he speak sharply again or even look sharply. There. Now, Abigail, you take this letter. A letter? It's only a note, only a tiny note. He need never know. Really, Miss Elizabeth, how... Take it for me, please, now, before he comes. How can you ask me? I'm a servant. If you're his sister, if you don't dare, how can you expect me? Abigail, be hush. That was a step on the stairs. He must be stopping on the second floor for his pipe. Now, Abigail, I want you to do as I say, and without a word. Oh, you shouldn't ask. While I'm reading this Bible to Stephen... You sneak out the back and across to the tavern. No, indeed. You can keep your notes. There's bound to be some captain sailing for London. Give him this. Oh, Abigail. It's the only hope I have. Abigail, if you have any mercy and you get this note out of the house for me, please. Abigail. It's in the rock. There's your Bible open and don't ask me to go against the master again. I beg you. Oh, whatever he says I must do and so must you if you know what's good for you. Did I hear someone call to me to come in? Or perhaps I'm not quite welcome. Sister, you welcome your brother. Indeed, Stephen. You are welcome. Abigail, draw me up that chair and then you may leave. I always remember when I was a boy and father read prayers. I sat on that chair. That was before you were born, Elizabeth. But Abigail can remember. Thank you, Abigail. Good night, sir. A good night, ma'am. Shall we proceed? I don't suppose you happen to recall the chapter. And there appeared a, a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Elizabeth, didn't I notice something slip from your Bible? Sir? Some paper of some sort. Oh, yes, thank you. No, no, don't trouble. I'll pick it up. But, Stephen, it's something... Please do read on. It's something of mine. Elizabeth! Read on. 
And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. Stephen, don't read it. I plead with you not to read it. Stephen! Stephen, may God curse you. Let go of that note. <laughs> Elizabeth, let go. Don't you? Hurt me. Drop it. Stephen, you're twisting my eyes. <laughs> Drop it. Drop it. Drop it. Well, that's better. Thank you. Surely you won't mind if I read it. Hmm. Mr. Benjamin West, artist. Bedford Street, Covent Garden, London, England. <laughs> Dearest, five years ago this night you left while I, your betrothed, lay here at home, locked from you by my tyrannous brother. That too ends in tyrannous, Elizabeth. Even now I am kept on the third floor in strict seclusion, allowed to garden only with my maid. Once a week I ride out, but always my brother rides with me. Oh, dear, dear. I find this rather shocking. But I gather that you have no relish for your life with me. Eh? There is no one I can turn to. No visitors ever visit here, except occasionally Dr. Benjamin Franklin comes to tea. Five years without you. Ben, will you never send for me as you said you would? It must be soon. Sometimes I wonder if my mind is slipping. The days I can endure. But the nights... Are not to be lived through. I am at the very limit of loneliness. Why have you never written? <laughs> well, Elizabeth, your pauper painter has written. But they were cruel letters. I have kept them from you. Out of my kindness. My wisdom, of course. He couldn't be cruel. Oh, yes. Benjamin West wrote you that he doesn't want you. No. Yes. That ill-bred tavern keeper's son has taken his brushes to London and splashed the town. Lords and ladies are now waiting on him, and you are quite erased from his canvas, my dear sister. It can't be true. Unfortunately, you might say it is. Well, I personally am glad I never wanted an artist to marry into this family. Now I don't have to worry on that score. At least West has settled it himself. He said he'd send for me. He said he would. <laughs> Stupid, moonstruck girl. You think any man could remember a woman for five years? And you're not even pretty. I was pretty. I was pretty five years ago. I could be pretty again. You have a weak chin. You're weak yourself. Only a brother would tolerate you. Hmm? Good night, Elizabeth. Oh, by the way, since you don't seem to appreciate the garden or your rides with me, and as you say, your mind is becoming somewhat disorderly, from now on it might be wiser for you to be completely confined to your room. No. Then at least you will appreciate my evening visits. No. Stephen, no. 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 Are you rosing the dead for a fire? Is this the Shore Mansion? Does Mr. Stephen Shore live here or hereabouts? He does. He lives here, but he wouldn't be home to you unless you mind your manners. I have a most important message for Mistress Elizabeth Shore. Elizabeth Shore? Aye. Why didn't you say so? Well, speak quick and stick to the point, and don't go booming your big waves through the house. For well, land's sakes, what puts you in a panic? The master's napping in the library, and I wouldn't for the world rose him. Now tell me, is it good news? Thank you, Abigail, but I'm well awake. That's all, Abigail. You may leave. Yes, sir. And Abigail. Yes, sir. Don't, under any circumstances, carry gossip to the third floor. Oh, no, sir. Now, my man, what is it you have for my sister? I'm not your man, sir. I'm captain in the Indian Queen. Oh, I see. Hmm. Well, I'm sent to fetch the young lady. And I have money and a message. Yes. Well, sir, she's to come to London. Her betrothed is now a famous painter. He is Benjamin West. He sent me here to Philadelphia, he did, and Miss Shoals to have passage back on my ship. Everything with him is all shipshape now, and he can't wait. For the girl, I mean. This is indeed a stirring moment. <laughs> so here, sir, is a bag and 20 sovereigns gold, 
And here, sir, is her paper for a passage on the Indian Queen. Deeply stirring. What's wrong? What's so stirring? My good man, three weeks ago, my sister Elizabeth passed away. Huh? Oh, you don't say. I knew Benjamin West would send for her. I always had faith in him. For months, I tried to keep her hopes up. But I failed. And she failed. Well, sir, and that's the end. And a sad one it is. Return the money to Benjamin West. I would I could console him. He, her betrothed, and I, her brother. We are doubly bereaved today. Miss Elizabeth, you shouldn't be here now. Oh, I have such news. It's nine o'clock. You'll come and find me. He isn't coming. He told me no prayers tonight. Abigail, whatever possesses you? I hid in the morning room and I listened. Oh, the news. Well, then tell me, is it good or is it bad? Both. Wonderfully good and horribly bad. Miss Elizabeth, you've been sent for from London. No. Mm, a sailor captain come to the door a while ago. Oh, such a pleasing, pleasant... Strong man. A man of real sturdy taste, you might say. Abigail, stop your chatter and tell me. I did tell you. You've been sent for. Money and passage for your Mr. Benjamin West. Oh, and it's happened. At last it's happened. Oh, but little good it'll do you. Do you know what I heard your brother say? Dead you were. No. That's what he says. Dead. And with that, the sailor left. Oh, dearie, dearie, we have to think of someone to help you. Shall I fetch Dr. Benjamin Franklin? I'm certain he's fond of you. I know he has an eye for the ladies, too. Abigail! Oh! Didn't I tell you not to come to the third floor? Oh, I thought your sister must have fainted, Mr. Shuler. I heard her fall, and I, I come running, running up. From here to the kitchen, you heard it? I was in the sewing room on the second, sir. Are you certain you didn't come running up to tell her about the arrival of a certain ship from London? Oh, no, sir. Then return to the sewing room. I will, sir. Uh, and Abigail? Do you know what happens in Philadelphia to a servant that is dishonest, disloyal, and corrupt? I think I do, sir. Hmm. I remember my father was forced once to denounce a servant to the justice. She was stripped to her waist and flogged. Good night, Abigail. Good night, sir. By the way, from now on, you are not to come to this room and you are not to leave this house. Very well, sir. <gasps> No, 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 Elizabeth. Settle in your rocker and all will be well. I believe it's my turn to read tonight. Ah, how thoughtful of you. A bookmark. Let's see now. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in purity from henceforth. These are they which were not defiled. You are listening to One Last Romance, starring Walter Hamden and Una O'Connor with Joan Loring and Stotts Cotsworth on the Cavalcade of America. Presented by the DuPont Company... Makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Elizabeth Shuel has been locked in a room by her brother to prevent her from sailing to England to marry the American painter Benjamin West. Well, her maid, Abigail, alarmed for the safety of her mistress has sneaked out to beg the help of an old friend, Benjamin Franklin, who's busy at work in his workshop. Oh, you haven't heard a word I said since I come in your workshop, Dr. Franklin. I declare you raised me heckles, you do indeed, sir, with all your infernal puttering. Abigail, hold this string for me. Now, don't move it. Oh, risk the skin on my back to come to you. You see that lever? Pull it towards you and hold it. But don't move the string. Dr. Franklin, how can you be as wise as they say you are and not have any Hold your breath and count three. 
At three, release the string. At five, throw the lever. Charles, did you intend to explode me? Well, uh, he that lieth down with dogs may rise up with fleas. Sir, are you an ant? Count. We'll both explode if you don't start counting. One. Ah, how good of you to be here. Two. A man who triumphs. Three. Without a woman by his side. Four. Abigail, you'll be known in history as the first witness. Five. Ah! Ah! Abigail. Oh, oh thank heaven, John Hort. What went wrong? Well, uh, well, uh, I wouldn't know exactly, but uh, from the immediate evidence, I, I seem to have changed a one-eyed horse for a blind one. Oh, dear. Well, uh, uh, Abigail, uh, sit down. Uh, why, uh, you're in quite a tremble. Um, though I must say, it becomes you. Ah, uh, now, Dr. Franklin. Uh, but what about me mistress? I, I mean, aren't you going to help her? Aren't you, aren't you going to rescue her? Oh, yes, yes, yes your mistress. Uh, well, uh, let's see. Uh, hmm. The Indian Queen is at the West Wharf. Hmm, yes. uh, Abigail, meet me there tomorrow at ten. Me? But whatever could a simple person like me do? By diligence and patience, the mouse bit in two the cable. Even if I could help, I wouldn't dare. Mr. Shule would have me flogged. Abigail, if you'll only listen. What do you do? I might have known you'd do nothing but talk and tinker and be useless. Abby, no, 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 you're trembling again. Oh, useless, that's what you are. All the things you write in that almanac of yours, and then when it comes to helping a poor little bird of a girl. Abigail, it's you who won't help her. Me? Yes, you. I have a scheme that will get her off fast and free to London. But you won't meet me at the Indian Queen. But the master ordered me not to leave the house, but... Oh, I do want to do well by her. Well, well done is better than well said, isn't it? Yes, sir. Good. Then meet me at the harbor tomorrow morning, ten sharp. <laughs> you're going to be part of this, Abigail. Oh, little do you know what a big part you're going to play. <laughs> Well, Dr. Franklin, it was a high honor to have you set foot to this ship, and we'll do our best to oblige you. Well, as long as you're going to sail tomorrow, in any case. And as long as we're loaded, there's no reason we shouldn't oblige you by pulling anchor this afternoon. Good, good. Are you <laughs> sure that you've left port by tea time? I am, and we'll be waiting just out of sight around the bend, stroke of twelve tonight. Good. Come along, Abigail. And that's all, sir? Uh, yes, I think so. Oh, uh, one thing. I must have a ladder. Uh... We don't have no ladder, sir. A rope ladder? Oh, that, yes, indeed. Uh, take that one laying right there. What? Oh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, you mean the girl's going to climb out the window of her house? And why didn't you say so? Uh, three men may keep a secret, Captain, if two are dead. Hmm. And just how do you figure to get a rope ladder past the brother, huh? Never thought on that. <laughs> oh, yes, sir, indeed I did. Abigail, Abby. Yes, Dr. Franklin. A Abigail, I want you to lift your skirts. Dr. Franklin, how dare you? Why, uh, uh, surely you have a petticoat on. Sir, I have five petticoats on. Mm. Then if you hoist two for our emergency, that will leave you three for your propriety. <laughs> but Dr. Franklin, I don't... Now, Abby, do you but... see that rope ladder? You're wearing that home. Oh, that ladder? So hoist your skirts, woman. And turn while the captain and I wind you. Oh, really, I don't know why I let you. Well, didn't I say that you little knew what a big part you'd play? Yes, sir, but I never expected... Hoist, that. woman. <laughs> oh, all right, then. But... Well, hoist oh. and keep turning to starboard. Oh, 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 oh! Oh, oh I declare never an army born gay. Oh, you men! <laughs> Good afternoon, Abigail. Is the master in? Oh, he is indeed, Dr. Franklin. He's in the morning room. Did he miss you? I told him I went shopping. Lovely afternoon, isn't it? Oh, and what a nice it'll be. Full moon. Did you get the ladder up to her? No. He's been watching me like a hawk. Well, where's the ladder now? Uh, where do you think? <laughs> Abigail, is that Dr. Franklin? Oh, come right into the morning room, sir. Abby, wait. Tell your mistress I'll have a carriage here at 11 sharp tonight. Fine. Uh, the, the master was only now saying how lonely he was at his tea, Dr. Franklin. Come in, come in, doctor. Join me in tea, won't you? Oh, uh, there you are by the window. 
My, my, what a very fine view you have of the harbor, Shule. Yes, do sit down. Where are you going, Abigail? I, I thought Miss Elizabeth should have her tea now. By no means, she's too ill. Shule, you were... Have you seen that really handsome schooner in from London? Uh, she's called the Indian Queen. Now let me see if I can find her. I heard she was moored along... Oh, she must have left. Why, there she goes under sail. What? The Indian Queen? The Indian Queen under sail? What a sight of beauty. Oh, there she goes. Down the river, back to London. Oh, uh, Abigail. Uh, yes, sir? On second thought, I think now you might take up tea for Miss Elizabeth. Cheer oh. her up. Oh, rest assured of that, sir. Oh, she'll be vastly cheered. <laughs> now. It's chilly here in the garden. Are you certain you told her? Ah, uh, Dr. Franklin, stop fretting. Oh, her light only now just went out. There she is now. Ah, now, that's it, Elizabeth. Climb down. Don't fear. The rope's, the rope's fine. I tied it tight. Drop your valise. No, let it go. Well, fetch the bag, Abigail. I can steady the rope alone. Oh, oh she broke the sewing room window. Don't oh. stop, Elizabeth. Don't stop. I'm coming as fast as I can. Look, look, look. Dr. Franklin, a light just went out in the master's room. Oh, he must have heard the glass break. You'd better jump, Elizabeth. He'll shoot if he sees us. I swear he will. Jump. Jump, dearie, jump. Oh. Where's the carriage? Dr. Franklin, look. He's at the window. The master's at the window. Run now, run. Oh. Come on, come on. Who's that down there? Hello, you. Hand or I'll fire. Hand or I'll fire. back, Elizabeth. It's all moon and shadows on the river road. Anyone following us? No, I, I think not. Uh, now watch for the blink of a red lantern. Yes. We should be on it by now. Oh, is that the ship out there? Yes, that's it. But where's their dinghy? Their dinghy was to be waiting here at Saunders Creek at 12. There it is. There's the light. Ah. Oh, oh, oh. Ready and waiting, sir. Dr. Franklin, I bless you always. Here, I'll give you a hand down. Up now. <laughs> Come soon to London so I can show you what this means to me. Well, show that young man you're going to marry. Benjamin West's a great painter, Elizabeth. You must inspire him. Inspire him with the wonder, the majesty, and the meaning of this country. I will, Dr. Franklin. I want to. We'd better be going, miss. Yes, sir. Uh, this lad will row you out. Goodbye, Miss Elizabeth. Goodbye, Abigail. Goodbye, Dr. Franklin. Goodbye, Elizabeth. I want to kiss you. There. Step right in, ma'am. Step in. Goodbye. Goodbye, my dear. Oh, goodbye, Miss Elizabeth. <laughs> well, Abigail, that's done. Uh, shall we sit on that log for a minute? I want to look at that ship putting out to sea. Ah, uh, I never would have believed you'd do such a thing as this. Well, Abigail, men and melons are hard to know. Uh. How good and brave you must be. Oh, you must feel, Dr. Franklin. No, oh, no, I'm sad. Mm. Rope ladders at my age. That was my last romance, Abby. Can you hear it? Fading away, fainter, <sighs> farther, and, and forever. Like the sound of those oars. My last romance. Dr. Benjamin Franklin. How effectively he sympathized with the young in heart. How truly he wanted people to be free. This was his last romance. A lighter moment in a life rich in wisdom timeless in its devotion to the aspirations of the human spirit. In 1777, Franklin stated the lasting principles of liberty and how fitting it is tonight that we Americans in this generation 
recall his glowing words. Those who live under arbitrary power do nevertheless approve of liberty and wish for it. They almost despair of recovering it in Europe. There's a common observation here that our cause is the cause of all mankind and that we are fighting for their liberty in defending our own. Now, Bill Hamilton speaking for the DuPont Company. We can stamp out tuberculosis, get rid of it forever with all of its tragedy and heartbreak. Medical science tells us this is true. But one thing we must do to put an end to tuberculosis is find the disease early and treat it right away. With this in mind, American cities, counties, even whole states are urging everybody to have a chest X-ray. The best way to make sure you are in good health is to get one of these x-rays. Nowadays, traveling units are able to take x-rays of thousands of people in a short time at low cost. And here's how they do it. You stand in front of a machine that holds an x-ray tube. The rays from this tube cast a shadow picture of your lungs on a screen which fluoresces or glows. A photograph of the image on the screen is then made with a small camera. The X-ray specialist plays a vital part in the diagnosis and treatment of human ills. He is called a, a radiologist. And it is his cooperation with the makers of X-ray apparatus that has helped to advance X-ray diagnosis. Among his important tools are fluoroscopic and intensifying screens. Up to 1914, such screens were not very satisfactory. But at that time, a young chemist named Carl Patterson introduced a new type of screen based on his discovery of a new fluorescent chemical. This discovery and its use in these screens was the beginning of a long record of Patterson development and improvement. Among the improvements are those which make present mass X-ray surveys possible. Today, these screens are made by the Patterson Screen Division of the DuPont Company. Now that science has made it possible for us to have our chest X-rayed in a few minutes' time, Every one of us ought to take advantage of this opportunity. A visit to a mobile unit or your family doctor for an X-ray is well worth the few minutes it takes. It may lengthen your life. X-ray films and chemicals and the Patterson X-ray screens, which are helping in this great national drive to stamp out tuberculosis, are products of the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Tonight's cavalcade play, One Last Romance, was written by Halstead Wells, original treatment by Anne Barley. It was based on a passage in America's Old Masters by James Thomas Flexner, published by the Viking Press. The program was directed by Jack Zoller. Music was composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Bryan. Your narrator, Ted Pearson. Next week, as the nation celebrates Lincoln's birthday, Cavalcade will present an absorbing and affectionate drama of young Abe as a storekeeper in Illinois. Our star will be the popular and talented favorite of the screen, Zachary Scott. Cavalcade of America comes to you each week from the stage of the Longacre Theater on Broadway in New York and is presented by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.